Memorial Day is America's day to say thanks to those who have served and sacrificed defending our country, a country that has been at war nonstop now for nearly 13 years. Nearly 3 million Americans have put on uniforms and served in Iraq and Afghanistan. So we honor and thank them this weekend, as well as their brothers and sisters in arms who fought in Vietnam and Korea, World War II, and those who served before them. I have the enviable job as a reporter to travel and live with the military and tell the stories of the people who step up and serve their country. I'm just back from a week embedded with the Air Force on a mission to Afghanistan. And I traveled there with a Fort Lauderdale veteran who, though badly wounded nearly a half century ago, wanted to reconnect with those serving under fire. But we start now with a conversation with two Iraq War veterans whose post-war struggles at home illustrate that there's a cost that comes with service, sometimes physical always emotional. Travis Drew enlisted in the military right after the 9-11 attacks. He served as a medic with combat troops on the ground and with the Army's fabled dust-off helicopter crews in the air. This is my death card that I put on. It's uh, April 14th, 08. That's when I lost Corporal Vasquez. It's the one American soldier, that, the only American soldier that's ever come on my aircraft alive and left dead. Uh, to top it off, he was an acquaintance, and it, it's a <clears throat> that's a rough one for me. A lot of stuff from the different units, the different times downrange. He's on 100% disability for post-traumatic stress. It's unfortunate, but it's the, it's the staunch reality of it. We're never going to be the same as we were before. You know what I mean? You can't, there's, I don't know, chemical imbalances or whatever you want to call it, but things have shifted entirely too much. It's like a Pandora's box, because you go from everything that you've had clogged up for so long, and then it's, just, it's like a mushroom cloud going off in your head. I, I, when all this first went down, I still have times like this now, I equate it to a few different things. It's like a pile of white coat hangers in my head. Take a freaking big mass of, they all got to be the same color, shake them all up, throw them in a box, throw them on the floor, and now try to easily and quickly, you know, discombobulate them all and put them back the way they're supposed to be. It's not going to happen. Rebecca Spencer looks for all the world to be the young, successful doctor she planned on being. New Hampshire born, a high school graduate, at 16. Her grasp of the sciences were propelling her toward her dream of being accepted at Harvard Medical School. But war intervened. As a reservist, she was assigned to brief the press in Iraq during the search for weapons of mass destruction. And one traumatic event changed her life forever. The crash of a Humvee on a crowded Baghdad street. She was in the back seat. The memory of the moment lingers years later. They were driving far too fast, and we almost killed an Iraqi family. The woman in the passenger seat in the front, she was beautiful. Her head was covered, but you could see her face, and she was holding a child that looked to be about two years old. He or she was standing up on her lap, adorable. She was screaming. The kid was joyous, and we went airborne. And then all of us saw that vehicle headed towards us with the family in it. And in order not to land on top of them and crush them, the driver whipped the wheel to the right. And when we landed, we landed on our right two wheels. Rebecca suffered a traumatic brain injury. I never got medical treatment. And there are three portions of my brain that don't process activity right anymore. And I'm so angry that I was left behind in the open. I'm angry that I didn't get the treatment right away that I should have gotten. And I was gonna go to medical school. And every day is a king struggle since I've been home. One of my soldiers tried to kill himself. 
one of the soldiers that I worked with in another unit killed himself two weeks ago here in Massachusetts. Two days after I found out about that, I found out that one of my female soldiers killed herself. And I tried to kill myself three months ago. Ramstein, Germany, May the 8th, two weeks before Memorial Day. After 13 years of war in Afghanistan, the caring choreography of bringing the wounded home is executed with precision. On this flight, on our flight, is a first lieutenant who served at forward operating base Shank one of Afghanistan's most dangerous places, taking daily fire, only to be injured in a terrible vehicle accident while off duty. She's being flown back to the States on an aeromedical flight to Andrews Air Force Base. She's in a coma, a catastrophic brain injury. Her parents are with her on the military flight. So is her three-year-old daughter. Air Force CCAT teams comprised of a trauma doctor, a pulmonologist, and a trauma nurse will never leave her side on the nine-hour flight. On the second stretcher, a young soldier who suffered a stroke. Watching over all of the patients, veterans of hundreds of missions like this, and they want to remind you of something this Memorial Day. The conflict still isn't over. Uh, there's a lot of young men and women out there in harm's way that are still getting hurt, uh, still getting uh, uh, blown up, and still uh, requiring you know, some pretty significant medical services. I'm an advocate of telling people that the war is not over with yet. Um, and we must always remember our soldiers. Every mission is different, and every mission um, touches my heart greatly um, because every patient has a story and every patient has a family. And I have a family, so I, I connect very much so with the patients. Um, and um, they, they, uh, they need to go home to their families, and uh, we want to get them, get them there safely. So we do everything in our power um, and it's a great honor to bring them home. Our plane is full of service people with varied injuries. We've just flown to Germany from Afghanistan to report on what could be the last year of the long war. While some struggle badly back home in the United States, here in Afghanistan, thousands of Americans are very much engaged in the work of war. I'm in Bagram, Afghanistan, the big base in the north central part of the country, where uh, the fighting season has begun once again. And despite the fact that there is a drawdown, many believe this could be a very bloody end to the war. If you think the American Afghanistan military has slipped quietly into safe retreat, you're wrong. The week before we arrived in Bagram, four U.S. soldiers were killed in four separate attacks in eastern Afghanistan. It was only reported by hometown papers. And doctors in what is likely the best trauma facility in the world, in Bagram, are still, every day, treating terrible war injuries. And that is the signature wound. It's the dismounted IED blast with both legs, maybe an outstretched arm, and then because of the blast, it goes up into the perineal area with abdominal wounds. So they're complex, complex wounds that multiple teams need to be a part of to help fix that soldier that's been injured that way. So it's because of the, 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 the body armor, people are surviving more, but they have these more devastating wounds. These military doctors comprise what is arguably the best and most experienced trauma team in the world, most served in Iraq as well as Afghanistan. Reputable news organizations put the number of war injured from the two wars at 900,000. 270,000 brain injuries. What time did you guys need? We can move her right now. Okay. This we got to clean up here. Hey, we got to clean up here. So, yeah. 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 Mike, you ready to go? Yeah, man. Tell me. Okay. During our short visit to Afghanistan, we wanted to judge the tempo and threat level as the war winds down. So we spent time with the Air Force pararescue jumpers, the legendary PJs. They are still going outside the wire to fight their way to the injured. Hey, Recheck it. Tighten it down. Shortly after this drill, they raced to their Blackhawks and launched a real-world mission. Mm -hmm. 
at Heath Craig Hospital on the base at Bagram. There are pictures and profiles of some of the 3,439 Americans killed in the line of duty in Afghanistan. Behind the curtains in the intensive care unit, not just American soldiers, but injured Afghan civilians. Our military turns no one away. It's not a hearts and minds strategy, a PR offensive. It's real. This from a veteran nurse. I don't think most Americans realize that we offer this, and that this kind of kindness is being extended. Is it, what does it make you feel like to, to do this? Uh, it's, like I said, it's very humbling. Um, you know, there's a, there's a very unfortunate side of war and very, um, very traumatic injuries that we see day in and day out. But when we see uh, children coming into our hospital beds and performing surgeries and giving them, um, you know, world-renowned care day in and day out and seeing them leave with a smile and, you know, um, seeing the trust in their eyes that they have for Americans after uh, the care that we give them, it's, um, it's a really good feeling. And it, I feel like I make a difference not just for the mission, but like in, in the world in general. Children are so often victims of insurgent attacks and sadly on occasion victims in the collateral damage of U.S. bombing runs. A little Afghan boy injured in a bomb attack comes to the hangar with his uncle, a gesture of thanks to the helicopter crew that transported him to help. He was out there um, just be, being a child. And, you know, us getting the call to go get him was, you know, something else. I mean, it was, for us, it's, you know, you see a little kid, and I've had little children. Uh, for us to go out there and get him and provide him the treatment and to see him the next day, um, you know, being a kid, starting to, you know, I'm ready to go home. That's, you know, what he wanted to do. That was excellent. That was awesome in our, uh, on our end. And the fact that he's back here today shaking my hand, being a kid, you know, that, that is, it's great. The dust-off Black Hawk crews continue to board lightly armed helicopters flying over Taliban-controlled villages to pick up injured soldiers and Afghan civilians. Every day at Bagram, fearsome A-10 warthogs and lethal F-16s fly offensive missions. This is Lieutenant Jeff Witt of the Alabama Air National Guard. His bombing run on his first mission ever in Afghanistan he eliminated insurgents who were exchanging fire with the U.S. troops. He does not fit the profile of a fighter pilot. A 2009 graduate of Harvard with a degree in economics, he was the starting quarterback on the Harvard football team. He spent time on Wall Street until he followed a calling to serve his country. I learned a lot about finance, but I also learned a lot about myself, realized that uh, I didn't want to be a banker, I wanted to be a fighter pilot. And uh, so I, uh, after I graduated in June of 2009, I pursued that and uh, was about three years later in an F-16 cockpit. And uh, I'm missing my five-year college reunion right now to, uh, to be here. Witt was just back from a bombing run when we spoke to him. It was my first sortie, uh, my first combat sortie in country. And as soon as we took off, we were uh, called to support uh, Army forces, American Army forces at a forward operating base. Uh, they were under attack by uh, some insurgents, and we were called on on the scene to um, basically employ ordinance to uh, to uh, cease contact for them. Which you did. Which we did. In every forward operating base, committed people, some of whom will be forever marked by their experiences as warriors. All right, very good. So we got a sample brief for the project. Which brings us back to Florida to the office of a prominent Fort Lauderdale attorney right. named Arthur Rice. Sure. April 26, 1969, Vietnam. 45 years ago, Army First Lieutenant Art Rice was flying his Cayuse helicopter on a hunter-killer mission 15 feet above the elephant grass when he took ground fire, AK-47 rounds. They ripped through the bottom of the helicopter, severely injuring both of his legs. Shrapnel destroyed a vital artery in his right leg. It could not be saved. Rice, a tough guy, adapted. Decades passed, his career flourished, but the memories of his time under fire of his aeromedical ride home linger on. You would think a man who has given that much to his country would never venture that close to the fight again, but there was Art Rice boarding an Air Force flight to Germany, an aging warrior 
headed into what some consider the heart of darkness, Afghanistan. The flight from the U.S. to Afghanistan is 16 hours. Lots of time to get to know the crew, think about the mission, and think about what is to come. So, what kind of patient will you be bringing back? Well, it, runs, it runs the whole gamut. We run, uh, we got inpatient and outpatient. C-17 flies a classified approach. We had the rare opportunity to be allowed by the Memphis National Guard unit piloting the plane to bring our camera into the cockpit of the C-17. Lights out over concern about shoulder-mounted missiles or ground fire, they made a steep combat approach into the Bagram airfield. We've just swept in over the Hindukush Mountains and are making a steep full-power landing. This is the view from the jump seat. We arrive to a base that remains on a 24-hour alert. The old Russian control tower still stands at Bagram Air Base, a reminder of Russia's disastrous war in Afghanistan. Once you step off the plane, onto the tarmac, then into the hangar where the rescue helicopters are, you realize very quickly the war is still going on. I mean, this is you know, another deployment for many of us. You know, we're still doing this rotation. You know, I mean, we're missing our families too, but at the same token. These young men and women are out there, and that's what we're here to support them. And, you know, because you know, they are out there. Trusted Afghan nationals are still allowed on the base, but security is extraordinarily tight. The U.S. military generally stays inside the wire unless there is an imminent threat. Rice's arrival at the dust off hangar, the reception given him by the Army's Airborne Rescue Squadron, is deeply moving. Two generations have flown wartime missions since Art Rice was under fire in Vietnam, but the young medics and pilots welcome him as a brother. You see uh, the Black Hawk, uh, and think back to when I flew the helicopters, you know, it was like they had dirt floors and wooden rotor blades in comparison. So that's an amazing piece of uh, machinery. I'm on, you know, on like excess baggage. I'm like, when I heard he was coming over, I just... You the know, connection between Rice and his modern-day counterparts is immediate. I couldn't get over all the guys in Afghanistan are thanking me. And, uh, you know, I found that to be just so incredible that I was just blown away by it. It was me, you know, who really, uh, uh, you know, should have been thanking them. You see anything under their wood? I don't see anything down there. Missions here are still in the Army vernacular kinetic. One of the Blackhawks recently took heavy fire rescuing an injured soldier. The Red Cross on the helicopters means absolutely nothing. In fact, it makes the Blackhawks even more prized as targets. The Taliban does not honor the Geneva Convention. So when Art Rice boarded the Blackhawk and joined the crew, he was turning back the clock, and he knew it. The helicopter is such a great piece of machinery. You know, it fired those flares. I didn't even know what they were when the flares fired. I knew that they weren't tracers because they were going in the wrong direction. But, but I felt good. I, I felt I felt really comfortable. I thought that I might be, um, you know, a lot more nervous than I was uh, when I was, you know, thinking in the few days before we left uh, to go on the trip. Uh, I thought that I would be a lot more nervous, but I wasn't. And uh, I think a lot of it had to do with the professionalism of the people that we were flying with. 
30% of the 2.5 million Americans who put on uniforms and served in Iraq and Afghanistan suffer some sort of emotional stress, that according to military studies. What about the effects of that terrible injury nearly a half century ago? Does Art Rice have PTSD? I would say, the first thing I would, I would blurt out, I'd say, no, I don't. But uh, the truth of the matter is, is that I probably do. And I know it's not like when I, when I first came back. When I first came back, you know, I hated to go to the beach and... Uh, you know, I didn't want to. Uh, I didn't want to wear uh, shorts, and uh, the prosthetic devices were much different then. Yeah. And so, uh, it was harder to um, to to walk and look anything close to natural. War uh, changes you, and um, it a life experience like that can't but help change you. War is bound to have uh, a different effect on, on different people, but it has an effect on everyone. It's just that it differs from person to person. So the magazine's in, I'm gonna release the charging handle, or excuse me, the bolt's gonna go forward, and now I'm hot. High capacity magazines. So 30 rounds, that quick. Travis Drew is several years out now from the horrors of Iraq. He lives on a hilltop in a rural town with his wife and small kids in Maine. He says he likes the 360 view of approaching vehicles. For the most part, I'm on high ground. I can see my roots. I know my exit and my vantage points. I know the community. I generally, for the most part, know the vehicles that are up and around when people are going slow or whatnot. There's a maintenance test pilot, a couple of aircraft up and running, uh, Joshua Kepfer. He was crew chief, CE. He's surrounded by other veterans who have had similar experiences, and he finds comfort in that. I experienced hearing voices for a while. I experienced seeing dead people for a while. The person that I kept seeing was a soldier that I lost. You know, the voices that I kept hearing, I don't know what the hell, where they came from, it wasn't mine, and all I said was fuckers all the time. I get irritated, and it's just you know. I'm not schizophrenic, I'm not crazy. I'm a little disconnected here and there. Rebecca Spencer, who relies on cranial sacral massage as therapy, still struggles daily. The TBI, the traumatic brain injury she suffered when her Humvee flipped, has led to emotional and physical complications. So I was in so much pain when I came back and my kids found me unconscious a few times and were terrified. Uh, and I have a heart problem and diagnosed. I go into um, irregular rhythms and uh, PTSD. And at first, I didn't, I was like, no, I'm gonna get better. I don't have PTSD, I don't want that diagnosis. But, uh, you know, it's there, it's real. And I recognize that now, but it is so difficult. There's some things in life that you just simply can't be a witness to. I buy into that wholeheartedly, and I totally understand where he's coming from. You just can't be a witness to certain things. If you allow things to process through your head, and that's what happens to a lot of us, in my theory, mm -hmm. we shut it down, we come back, and then when you get time to sit around, you know, idle hands or devil's workshop and all that, mm -hmm. it just peels through your head, you know, and it will eat you alive if you don't try to get some kind of comprehension or understanding of it. Mm -hmm. You know, and a lot of us use, you know, our battle buddies, people that have been there and done that. A lot of us don't want to talk to anybody who hasn't been there and done that, you know what I mean? I don't want to yeah. sit here and tell my wife that I've had to kill people. I don't want to tell her that people died on me. I don't want to tell her that people tried to kill me. If you deploy, you come home and you're thrown right back into. I'm a single parent, so for me, you know, parenting and my kids needed me so much. And I really feel like what they went through, it's really like they were deployed too. Uh,
Most of us have never been to war. Most of us have never served in the military. Only 3% of Americans are active in that community. And very few of us have sacrificed with no bitterness the way Art Rice has. Earl Barnhart. Well, that's gross. Did you know, did you lose guys, friends? No. Never did? No. Huh. You know, not in not in a unit that I was assigned to. Guys that I knew in OCS, a lot of them died. Take a walk along the Vietnam Memorial Wall, the granite sloping upward as the casualty count grows, name after name chiseled in the granite. On Memorial Day weekend, it might be good for all of us to think about the four soldiers lost in Afghanistan when we were there in early May, their deaths only noted in their small town papers. You might want to say a prayer for that first lieutenant whose parents call her Kimmy, who served in Afghanistan's most dangerous outpost and may never gain consciousness. And it might be helpful for all of us to listen to the simple request that is echoed by so many veterans. You know, it's always nice to hear thanks. All the great things that we have, everything um, that we enjoy in the United States, that we take for granted every single day, the, and especially uh, perhaps uh, uh, the things that we enjoy on this Memorial Day holiday, uh, we owe to uh, the troops who put their life on the line every day for us and who uh, permit us to enjoy those things. I think everybody should, uh, you know, maybe take a moment and just reflect on the fact that if it weren't for these people who were willing to put themselves out there like that each and every day of each and every year, uh, this might be a different situation that we'd be in and we wouldn't all be having such a wonderful holiday. On Veterans Day, New York City is going to host a ticker tape parade in the Canyon of Heroes for troops returning from both wars. It'll be a moving, nationally televised event, and it is overdue. 7,809 U.S. soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines died in combat in those wars. More than 60,000 have come home wounded. So here on this weekend, we salute them and all the warriors from other conflicts who came before them. I'm Tim Malloy. Thank you for watching.